over here. Think very, very, very nice that you joined this this studio visit. A new thing that we introduced this year: the studio visits um, in this in this COVID edition. And we always uh, like to connect the uh, practice of, uh, of doing this stuff in uh, in in building IoT and services uh, with the uh, more the academics that we also have a lot of, at a conference. And this, this combination is really nice. So I was thinking that that when we are all of, uh, yeah, we are now at home at our home offices, but still still nice to, to have a look in how how these, uh, these studios work and what, what they look like and what kind of things they do. So in this session, we will uh, be invited to info. Uh, it's a company that I know also myself very well because I also still uh, <laughs> work there uh, next to organizing these kind of events. Um, but I asked two, two of my colleagues to uh, introduce uh, a, a very nice project I chose uh, to, um, that, that really is relates to the topic of, uh, of, of things gone, I think also other things that do. So Laura and Sebastian, Will uh, will show something about CoEx, I think, and but also, uh, I hope something about uh, how our company looks like and stuff. So, no, but I leave it to you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I will. I will switch off my camera and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, I will do the same. I guess until the end. Uh, let's see here. Screen one. Okay, okay. Um, so welcome everyone to this uh, socially distanced good things fest. Uh, Iskander said thanks, so I'll return the thanks. Uh, thanks to Iskander and the team for setting it up and being interested in the, I guess, good things we do. Um, so today we info will share a bit about our work related to the intersection of vertical farming, IoT and robotics. And you will learn a bit about the basic principles of service design and hear our take on applying it within the vertical farming contest to show how it um, yeah, how it helps enable coherent service experiences and provide certainty for future decisions when dealing with new innovation. So um, we'll start with a small introduction of uh, the speakers today. So myself and Laura we will then move on to introducing our company and then the startup we're working with GrowX. Um, now, since the ambition today was to do a studio visit or visits, I should say, um, we've done our best to give a glimpse into our world in a corona-proof manner with some short uh, video tours that I'll try my best to guide you through. Uh, and after those little virtual tours, we'll move on to the, the, the challenge of this project and our approach where the principle was, would then um, sort of resurface around service design. So for today's team, first say hello to Laura. Can you say a bit about yourself? Hey, well, to keep it short, I'm, I'm, I'm Laura Martim. I'm a service designer from Spain. And well, I've been working for this amazing company for the past uh, two years now. And today, together with Sebastian, I will be guiding through the, this challenge and giving you some inspiration and information about uh, service design. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I myself am from Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. I've been with the company for three years and one month, two months. Um, and I also work as a service designer. And besides that, I head up the design discipline at Info. Now, as promised, we'll start with a little tour of our offices. So here we go. Um, and I believe maybe our intern that made this video is part of it. Anyways, for the attentive viewer uh, or people who just like go drinking at Newmark, you will just notice that from that quick view, we are located in the heart of Amsterdam. It's a short walk from the central station. And about the office itself, it's a charming building that was made in 1954, 55. The ground floor was actually used as a public postal office. Uh, so here you see some of our workstations. That's actually the owner sitting there. Um, the basement, which is accessible by going down the stairs, uh, was actually used for a, a, a place to get the mail sorted, et cetera. Today it's used for meetups, parties, lab activities. Um, so this is the main three floors and of course under normal circumstances we house uh, anywhere from 80 to 100 developers, designers and so forth in our agile uh, teams. And we actually even have some of our Dutch colleagues today who has ties back to the original postal office uh, connection. They had some uh, postmen actually working there. So Amsterdam, the view again, this was a quick view of 
the, the office itself. And I'll explain a little bit about who we are. So Info is a full service innovation and tech agency. And for the last uh, 25 years, hence the age of the building also, we've been helping our clients create successful innovations and end-to-end -end solutions where we have a history of driving um, the development of products and services all the way from initial vision to implementation. And you see some examples of uh, that here, the types of clients we help. So there's Agen, Green Wheels, et cetera. And to give you a bit more of an interconnected view into some of our work, I'll just highlight uh, OB Feeds, uh, which one of our viewers is actually connected to, um, which you might uh, know or have used. It's a bike rental ecosystem connected to the public transport card of the Netherlands. And we're involved in the end-to-end -end experience of the actual rental service, the connected locking mechanisms, the, the consumer app, but also the repair system that goes on behind the scenes and actually keep the wheels turning, uh, in lack of a better word. Um, another example of our involvement with provenant Dutch innovation is within the field of horticulture. So we helped uh, grow fish, as they're called, with these stations um, sort of through the development of monitoring software and smart sensors for precision farming to really help Dutch farmers be the best in the world at official, uh, efficient water usage, but um, yeah, also to really monitor the type of health that the plants have. Which brings us to today's case, not within greenhouses, but within vertical farms. Uh, and this case really lies in the intersection between the plants, but then also robots, AI, and ultimately what it resolves in and how can it be beneficial for people, but also on a larger scale for our environment and society as a whole. So to introduce the company of GrowX, it's a vertical farming company that aims to supply well fresh produce to the hearts of cities. It's urbanized food solution, of course, through this disruptive new farming concept that's fully automated and AI uh, driven. And when we met them last year, it was running mainly uh, manual processes. So actually having traditional growers, harvesters, etc. But they had beginning robotic prototypes and a broad vision towards developing this further, but needed some help in realizing and building uh, the full vision, which is where we entered to help. Now, this farming as a service concept, as we call it, will just mean uh, no human labor uh, needed for seeding, growing, harvesting. And the data collection, which is the key ingredient combined with the AI insights, is um, being built on human expertise and quality assurance to ensure that the, the feedback loops continuously help sort of uh, improve the growth approaches that they have and also make it highly adaptable to, 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 the, to the food needs, the, the needs we actually have uh, in, in cities. Now, such a solution means uh, readiness for better climate regulation and the end results in things like um, low energy consumption and also circular waste management, which is an adaptation thing, of course. Now, as service designers, as what me and Laura are, we were asked to help with um, scoping this vision, this is a very big vision, into um, sort of a solvable and feasible starting point. This meant understanding the ecosystem of the necessary elements that goes into shaping such a service, but also how to build an implementation plan uh, to test the assumptions of the solution we wanted to bring forth. Now, in order to really understand how it all fit together and really obtain domain knowledge, we had to really immerse ourselves uh, into uh, sort of properly into this context, uh, get our hands dirty, so to say. So I'll present the, the second tour now, which has actually been our real working studio. We have hardly uh, been at Info. We have been at GrowX. So um, we start at the office area of GrowX. The most interesting part about this area, I think, is that we've had a lot of coffee here, <laughs> uh, consumed a lot of coffee while attempting to really understand the underlying elements of the vertical farm. Um, and going down the stairs, we enter into like the main growing facility. There's, of course, a few precautions you need to take here. So hygiene and disinfection is an essential element in such an operation. So you get used to all the cleaning, which, of course, is something everyone is used to these days anyways. We'll first look a bit at the, the, the cutting area, uh, which is um, it, it's a little bit smaller now. It, it used to like be more voluminous, not in the day we recorded this. And here is the actual facility where you see it consists of a few cells. You see some moving elements. Um, this is actually robots that go along these rails or gutters, as we call them. And what they do is that they do watering, uh, which you'll, you'll get a little bit of a close look at in a moment. But what they also do is that they provide sensor information to give insights into the health 
but they also do imaging. So they take photos and they create these image strips that we can use for analysis of growth and uh, further analytics. Um, so this is like, I know it's a very quick view on how it, it looks. There's a lot of elements that goes into these movable parts, but uh, in general, th this is the ecosystem that and the challenge we sort of had to solve. Um, and to summarize that a little bit, um, the challenge for this new concept was then for us to shape the vision and really help provide overview and evidence to properly build, test and, and, and scale it to achieve this farming as a service proposition they're looking for. And our approach to this really went through first uh, sort of uh, obtaining the, the main knowledge, as I said, but really understanding the key processes that went into this, then mapping them out to spot opportunities and potential challenges. This is where uh, typical service designers would sort of peek their ears of this typical approach. And we, of course, do that from like a business service and tech perspective. Now, furthermore, as I said, uh, Inserting ourselves into this ecosystem of the current growers was something we did to ultimately understand how they can teach the system um, to in the end actually be re replaced by it. So how can we ensure proper quality assurance? And this was also done to prioritize the key steps and create a roadmap which aligns on data strategy, implementation plan, and also the organizational needs that's necessary to support this vision. Um, and that meant that really ensuring that we sort of slowly scale it while testing along the way until we're ready to really fully launch this, the, the proposition itself. Now, th this can sound like a lot of elements and, and such a task of figuring out a feasible and viable model is, 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 is not an easy thing. And um, before we uh, get into the details of our approach, we'll, which Laura will share, um, I know there's a lot of different elements in here um, that needs to be considered to have this full vision. So I'll just try and give a little bit of an, an overview of the elements that you need to consider um, and you need to sort of have aligned before you go into the details. So um, beginning at the core of the service, we really started with looking at the plant life cycle itself, identifying essential needs for growing, for germination, seeding and, and harvesting. Um, from there on out, we align that with the needs of the growers and the challenges that they're currently facing in what I would call plant optimization in their daily rhythm. So how can we help uh, really improve that? And once we've obtained an understanding of the key needs and tasks that they have, um, their jobs to be done, so to say, we could work with our solution architects to identify and prioritize, prioritize what type of data is needed, not only to be generated, but also monitored and ultimately uh, acted upon, which then helps define the quality assurance and the feedback loops necessary to uh, to build this with the available expertise, and then finally inform the the sequences uh, for the automated uh, robotics to in the end adopt all these insights that we'll figure out. And finally, of course, the last part is to deliver this as a streamlined service, which in essence can be seen as an it's an arrangement between people and assets, the, the benefits and resources provided in our case. And for us as service designers, it's key to identify how to perform and enable this arrangement over time, which is why our approach very much revolves around uh, activities and methods that helps not only define, but also create these end-to-end -end experiences. And uh, this is ultimately what creates services that's conductive to uh, the vision and the, the grower's everyday rhythm but it's also where the business value comes in. Um, and finally, the outcome of aligning and experimenting with these elements resulted um, in a validated view moving forward. I'll just give a bit of an overview of how that can look sort of going left to right. And what it, what it helped us look into um, is really that it provided evidence and overview of how to align the service elements in a sharper way and really answer some key, key questions like what needs and problems does this automated uh, farming as a service vision actually answer in this form? How do we set up a scalable learning loop uh, for human expertise and technology? What's the first feasible version of this? Like how can we make the elements fit together in like a minimum uh, viable service? Um, and how to create a roadmap that integrates and validates the right services at the right time? Um, now, this way of working contextually by first framing problems and then understanding needs is it's typical for a, a people-centered design approach, uh, which I'm sure you heard of. But to showcase our approach today, we thought it'd be a little bit uh, uh, fun to 
to, to also rename it in our own context and chose to rename it around the core of the service, namely the biological element, uh, the plant itself. And I therefore present to you with the human in mind, um, plant-centered service design, which yeah. Laura will give you a bit of detail on that. Yes, I'm going to try to take um, the presenter now. Let me see if you can see my screen. Ah, uh, yeah, you can see my screen now. Uh, yes. Yes, great. Oh. Multiple times. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it's working. Great. So, well, yes, as uh, Sebastian just introduced, we reframe a little bit uh, the approach that we have. It doesn't mean that we didn't have humans uh, into account, because actually we did, as as he uh, introduced, we have this triangle in between humans, uh, the robots, and also the plants. But we we thought it was it was really interesting to to highlight the importance of this new actor in the in the ecosystem. We sometimes don't have this much uh, elements uh, to look at. So it's uh, I think it's, it's interesting. And I will and I'm going to uh, give you a um, a approach and, 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 and give you some direction on how this influence and how we tackle this challenge. But before going into those details, I think it's good that at least we get into an alignment of what service design is. Uh, Sebastian also mentioned a couple of things about it, but just to keep it short and to give you some um, information about it. Service design is a collaborative a strategic approach for problem solving. That's that's the short description. But what it does, it uh, balances uh, the, the needs of humans. So it integrates the user needs and the organization needs, balances them with the possibilities of technology. And the end goal is to find, I mean, in the end, to create an, a strategy, a service, a, an experience or a product that has a sustainable business growth. So in short, it's about uh, this balance in between what is desirable, what is feasible and what is viable. That's that's the, the first glimpse of what is service design. But a good way to understand how service design is approached and how this influence uh, the, the challenge that we had is through its principles. These five service design principles are the ones that we take a look uh, at info when we when we um, when the, when we encounter our challenges. From left to right, we have people center, evidencing, co-creative, iterative, and systemic. And what I will do, I'm gonna try to guide you through this principle and give you some examples of how um, how they influenced uh, our challenge with. I'm going to try to, to get into some details that might in, be interesting for you. So uh, starting from the first one, uh, well, we talked about this already, but um, well, uh, service culture as it takes into account user needs and, and, and motivation, that's the, that's the beginning of a, any challenge, trying to get into the understanding of those. But with, with the case of GrowX, it was slightly different because, of course, we needed, we needed to get into the details of, of understanding the growers and the users. But the plants had a huge role um, in this uh, process. So ourselves, it meant that we, uh, well, we needed to understand what the life cycle of this plant was, as Sebastian mentioned before understanding the different steps from the seeding to the harvesting, what are the key moments, uh, what are the, the, the things that influence the, the growth in a positive or a negative way, and try to map out all these different elements and, and, and unveil the, the, the key questions and opportunities we wanted to tackle for this farming as a service proposition. And this understanding, or trying to get into the details of this understanding, uh, led me to the second principle, which is about evidencing. And evidencing means that, uh, well, you base assumptions on facts. So we we don't design based on assumptions. We base we try to uh, base our decision and our designs on on facts. And the way to do so is through uh, applying research. So we at Info, we apply research on our challenges, the ones that requires this strategic perspective. And for the case of GrowX, uh, the first discovery track, I think it took us uh, around six weeks. 
but probably the half or at least two weeks of those uh, of that discovery track was us interviewing the growers, interviewing the users, and observing them in their daily activities. So we became their shadows. I mean, if you see this picture that I have right now in the slides, um, I think that was taken in one of the daily observations uh, we did. And this observation, this interview, uh, helped us to map out that relationship in between the, the, the growers, the, the different users, the plants, and also the robots, so the technology that was involved in there. And with this understanding, of course, um, there is a third element that service design has, which is uh, the collaborative dimension, and it's about co-creation. So, uh, Engaging stakeholders, of course, is important not only for uh, getting into an enlightenment and then to start any challenge, but it's also about having them in the key decision moments. But as well for ourselves, it was really important and relevant to, to gather through sessions where we just brainstorm about ideas, but also we map out different elements. So the picture you see on the left is from, I think, one of the first sessions that we have together with the CEO and the main grower to map out the different elements of uh, this life cycle. So understanding uh, what is the current process to start identifying the opportunity for the 2B situation. And the co-creation also, uh, well, lead me to the next one, which is about iteration, iterative. Um, well, Iteration is about you know getting feedback into your process and uh, base your decisions and the next steps on on learnings that you had. I mean, if you are in agile development or product development, this is not new because I mean, if, if in a sprint mode or in a scrum team, uh, feedback is <laughs> part of your day-to-day -day activities in the form of a retrospective or a refinement. But when you are in the discovery phase or in a strategy phase. Feedback loops are also important and in a higher level. So um, one example is on the right picture. It's I think it was uh, in the second week, we already had uh, some thoughts and some um, insights on some of the priorities or directions in terms of the high level strategy. And we, we, we do with we gather with the stakeholders and we um, integrated their feedback into into our proposal to redefine the next steps and to make sure that we went into the right direction in terms of where to put more focus on. But also a different level of feedback as the one that you see on the left picture, which is I think it was taken also in an early stage. That was one of the many remote feedback sessions that we that we had. And it was it was we for that session we used um, an early concept that you can see it's not really fancy but because at that moment in time we really didn't have uh, the necessity to get into a detailed mockup so it was just basically testing the value and understanding the key activities and needs for for the growers so but with that we integrated the feedback we of course get into different feedback loops uh, in the discovery track and eventually that all those different things can let you to define something and get into something more uh, close to implementation, which is the mock-up that you can see right now on the right. And it is uh, right now part of the implementation um, process. That is feedback and that is iteration. And the last principle, um, I really like it because it's the one that encapsulates uh, the rest uh, of the principle. It's about systemic, and being systemic is about the holistic mindset and view that you need to have in challenges of this nature that has so many key elements that's trying to solve this specific challenges really requires a broad uh, system view, a broad perspective. And I mean, there are many different ways uh, of getting into that type of overview. I mean, service design has uh, quite a few tools that can help you on that. We use for this challenge a blueprint, which is the, 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 the image that you can see in the background. A blueprint is a mapping framework that uh, it has this uh, strong benefit or helping you to get into the details of what happened in a visible line, so with the front line of any experience, service, or process. But also, it helps you to analyze and to get into the details of what happened in the backstage, so it, what is not visible. So in our case, 
uh, our front line was uh, all those details about um, the, the plants, the, the life cycle, the different steps, the, the processes, the interactions uh, in between plants, humans, and how the robots were taking uh, some of those uh, manual activities uh, in the automation, but also the backstage was all these nigri details about okay what are the systems that needs to be involved what are the sub processes what are the data points uh and then then in of course uh defining components so we used this overview to help us uh define an mvp and therefore a roadmap for it and i think with this one i went through the five if i'm not missing anyone yes so the five principles and before um getting into the questions i think it's nice to at least have a sneak peek of some of the things that we're implementing at the moment this is a short clip a short animation on one of the uh, um, elements that we're building uh, as uh, we mentioned we did this first discovery track, and right now we are uh, implementing the, the MVP and trying to get into an, uh, an MVP working really, really soon. And this one is a dashboard uh, that will help growers to make the transition from a fully manual labor to something that is going to be almost fully automated very soon. So they are changing their role uh, with, uh, with these new elements. And if you're still curious to know uh, more about service design, if you know how this can be applied to another challenge, we do have a webinar that we recorded a few months ago. It's in uh, our website in info.tiles info studio. I think the best we can do is just to copy the link in the comments so you can also get access to it. And I think it's a, it's a good lecture uh, to get into what service design is in a, in a more detailed form and also we went through uh, two different cases, one from OB Feeds uh, from NS, the, the one that um, Sebastian mentioned, but also uh, we uh, went through a case with ADN, which is the payment company um, from the Netherlands. And I think those two really uh, provide you a different perspective of how service design can be applied. And I think that was the last thing to share. Yes, so we, I mean, if you have questions, we will be happy to answer those. Uh, I think we still have a few minutes. Um, anyway, if you have also another question or something that you want to uh, reach out, just please do. This is uh, our emails, and we'll be happy to to get in contact with you. So I think that was it. Are you still there? Yes. <laughs> yes. Great. I hope someone else is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. And it interesting uh, i think and uh, yeah uh, can you hear me i think oh so yeah i i can hear you very, so we have still uh yeah i i hope i hope there are some people uh that to ask any questions or things you can also put it in the chat i think some uh, a lot of these uh, a lot of you have been oh yes um, mode, as i see it so. So, but, but please, please have, if you have a question, put it in the chat. Um, so, uh, well, yeah, how, how, oh, you put it, yeah. Well, we were in time, man, uh, One thirty. Yeah, you were, well, you're, you're in time. In, 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 I, I expected, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm looking into people, I have one of the questions I'm, I think it's an interesting uh, then what's the good so the first edition what they there you're already what we are already planning the first iterations of what when will will the first things happening you've probably mentioned that but um, Laura can answer that yeah. what, what do you mean with the iterations uh, he's that... asking about the implementation we're currently yeah, doing the implementation yes yeah, uh, exactly. we are currently doing the implementation so we started like uh, a month ago or so and mm -hmm. this this second track which officially the first track was the discovery track actually yeah. um it will take us to until somewhere in mid-january and um, i mean we're speeding up the process of getting into a good MVP 
There's also a few side projects on AI and machine learning that are trying to accelerate the process as well. So we're we're setting a, a good um, a good foundation for 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 a fully automated cell. Cool. And uh, and did you did you add the uh, the the, the, the how, how it's called in English the 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 stuff itself? What, what would, is it, is it tasteful? It's it's for especially for oh yeah the product. You mean yes? Yeah, I product. mean I was I was highly surprised how um, how different notes and tastes different tastes they have even with the same. I mean with the same seed they have different varieties. And right now one of the the biggest clients they have is a company that also provides this produce to high end restaurants. So. The end product needs to be uh, not top quality, so definitely the taste and and the quality of the product is is I mean it's the best I have tried and to be honest. And, there, and there, an, an interesting point about that is that there is what a grower uh, perceives as a, a healthy plant, and then there is the current trends of what high end restaurants want. And the interesting thing is that they can grow something from their perspective, uh, which is really healthy. But sometimes perhaps a trend is more sourness or other aspects and the, the adaptivity they now have to the system also means that they're able to adapt to whatever trend is, is, is needed. They can, so to say, adapt some of the plant profiles while others uh, mm -hmm. are used for other things. I think that's, uh, you mentioned that in some of the early interviews, which is, uh, it's, it's an interesting little quirk that a, a healthy plant is not necessarily what the chefs want. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and uh, are, are they adapting to that, or is it? You know, they do? <laughs> yeah, it, it really depends on uh, what the like what the order of delivery is. Yeah. I, I think for if they do a partnership with a supermarket, etc., it's more of a standard taste. I think it is really tasty, but it's just that sometimes uh, a, a certain a specific taste is maybe needed. So they have experts both on the gourmet area, but also on the, the growing area. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, I think it's neat. Uh, it was really, uh, really nice to also do to watch that uh, documentary, maybe to see a bit of how it looks. Um, if there are no other questions, maybe we just uh, just keep it with this. Oh, there is one. I was wondering. Yeah, I was wondering if this is a B B two B service. You can read it yourself, probably also <laughs> uh, for restaurants. Yeah. So. Yes. It's it's intended as a a well, farming as a service B two B service. There's there's no uh, a consumers uh, in, involved directly. Uh, so uh, one way of of thinking about this service is uh, creating a distribution center next to a Yumboro or an Albert Hein, and then depending on their their need and the season, uh, the, the 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 plan that provides the the necessary produce. Okay. No, we do not have individual farming kits. <laughs> this is very large scale. Exactly. Kits you have a bit of a D maybe, mono farming kit. Yeah, kits. kits. <laughs> there are many, there are many uh, of these things that we market. Yeah. And in this case, as Sebastian just explained, is a farming um, as proposition for Personally, I, I have an Arduino set that that's actually made for growing. So you if you 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 can look up sort of private growing, make make your own little uh, balcony garden, and there's actually Arduino sets that helps you with setting up some basic measurements. Cool. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there's a question yeah. about if it's a, is possible to compare the final product with a completely natural product. Um, yes, by doing this, you very much minimize not only uh, uh, diseases, but it's also about sort of the, the necessary water usage that you need to have. Um, there is something about the amount of CO2 that's also uh, uh, put in, and it's sort of, it, it, it means the ability for the plants to grow or sort of open its pores. So I I do remember them in, in more detail also explaining that there are ways of actually uh, being able to 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 see the the differences but also taste wise it's way more consistent so they from a streamlining perspective you get 
you probably went foraging and you get bad berries or you get good berries. In this sense, you get very streamlined, healthy plants. And also by recreating the perfect conditions on, on the growth in a fully automated uh, cell, I mean, it means that no human interaction is needed. So therefore you reduce the, the, the risk of getting into any disease or plaque. I mean, I've seen it myself that the flights and all these things, they get through the contact with the, with the upside. And most of the completely natural products that we uh, consume nowadays are full of pesticides and additives and things that actually speed up the process of getting a tomato or a lettuce uh, out there in the market very soon. So in this case, I think one of the positive elements is the, 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 the reduce or the no uh, pesticides at all because you recreate the perfect conditions and you condensate in, in, a, in a farm, in a, in a close isolated um, farm which for me i mean being a sustainable mindset person that's uh that's a huge uh, positive element yeah. and, but also, uh, are, the, are the differences yeah. only positive i would say from a subjective perspective of course from optimization standpoint it is very positive from the yeah. perspective of an authentic experience with different sizes and all those kinds of things you are the the the, the visual impression is perhaps a little bit different so you won't be able to find crazy growing plants unless you actually program for it <laughs> uh, this is just all very streamlined and consistent and maybe a little bit boring but in in a, in a quality perspective that's a good thing yeah and also i mean it's pace wise i mean if, if uh, taking into account how 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 fast uh, the the humanity is growing and and the needs in terms of future uh, feeding, it's, it's going to be huge. So this type of solutions are looking for into the future and how we can grow uh, with a better use of a space and, and technology can help you in that. So there is a misunderstanding sometimes that technology is uh, this evil uh, Terminator thing, but it, it doesn't, I mean, it's uh, it can bring a lot of positive and yeah, potential Yeah, this, this is the good things first, it's not the evil things. Yeah. <laughs> for us, no, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's why this is, yeah. It's indeed a a a good direction on how we need to do things in future, but doing it now. So that's um, cool. Okay, so thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. I think I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I don't want to hold everyone too long if it's not. But but we can also go go on and on if there is any question left. But uh, but otherwise maybe it's good to uh, to thank you for this uh, for this insightful presentation. I will put uh, me and Laura's email in the chat. And sometimes this area can also be confusing. And sometimes people need to think a bit about it. So yeah, always follow up with with uh, extra questions. Or if you want to after Corona come by and taste a the plant, they're very open for that. Also. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Are we going to build a, a little instance in our basement or not? <laughs> Maybe we should have. Uh, it could be seen, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay super well thanks 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 a lot again also thanks for all the people uh, joining in and listening in and i hope you uh, you have a good uh, you have a good feeling about uh, a good impression about uh, the work on growvex and and, and and info so uh, i think uh, it's really nice so thank you a lot uh, thank you join join other sessions uh, later today or tomorrow and, uh, and we will we'll meet soon yeah Ooh, okay Bye.